Genesis 1, 2 and 3 that we've been preaching through these last few weeks have been really interesting and I've been so encouraged and so has Jacob with the feedback from so many of you as you've been sharing of how God has been speaking through these uh, various passages and these last sermons. But just to recap, just briefly, Genesis 1, of course, overviewed the six days of creation and how God declared it all to be good. So the good creation that God gave. Genesis 2 unpacked what it was to be human and how it was good in the design and order that God had given humanity as image bearers in a world to take care of and steward and to make fruitful and bring all of the potential out of the creation that God had given mankind there in the garden. But then here this past Sunday, we looked at Genesis 3 in the first part of it anyway, in explaining what went wrong with all of this good creation, how sin entered the world, how Satan was at work and Adam and Eve fell in rebellion and disobedience and, and how that cursed and ruined all of God's creation. So as we open up this evening or this afternoon, if you're in the daytime HBF, rather than uh, roses and thorns, why don't we just stop for a moment and everyone in the room just share something that's impacted them most, perhaps something that's been most helpful to them as we've been preaching through these past weeks, something that's memorable, something that's been helpful, something that's in a material way God has used to uh, impact your walk and your Christian life. So maybe just share briefly everyone in the room. I'm sure everyone has something that they can share and we can encourage one another in that here for a moment. Great, well, why don't we dig into chapter three where we are uh, this evening or this afternoon. Why don't we just take a moment, go around the room, let's read a couple of verses each, and let's read all of chapter three together, just to give us the context, even though we're really going to unpack uh, just the first five verses. But let's read Genesis three together around the room. Well, on Sunday past there, just digging into the passage, I tried to unpack who this character is that we're introduced to in just these first two verses. So look at the first verse. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now the Bible interprets itself and we looked at Revelation 9, Revelation 12, where uh, we see in those passages how it said the serpent of old being the devil and Satan, uh, that old tempter, the serpent of old, who is Satan. These are the two passages that really help us understand who this character is in the form of the serpent here in the garden. Now, in this first little break here, as we come to conversation and discussion together, I wonder, we're introduced to this character, and at first glance, we read it over and over, and we don't really quite get the significance that this is a beast, this is an animal, what particular animal, we don't really know. I suggested perhaps an animal like a serpent that also has legs, thinking of like Komodo dragons. Who, who knows? Who knows? It's irrelevant, really. The point is, though, this is a beast of the field that is speaking and that is uh, seeking to bring about disobedience and distrust to God and his word. Now, I wonder, when we stop and think about this, and as I kind of brought out Luke uh, 14, where Jesus uh, casts out the demons from Legion and they go into the pigs and they run down into uh, the Sea of Galilee. We looked at the reality that Satan, as a spiritual being uh, with no body, and his demons, fallen angels that fell with him, who do not have bodies, they have to uh, inhabit or take the form of something that God has already created. And they can take possession of or uh, take control of animals and also humans, as we saw in the scriptures. And these are supernatural uh, situations. These are, these are spiritual, unseen things that happen through the form of physical and normal things. So just stop for a moment and let's discuss together what ways do you see in your own life, your own heart, your own mind, 
a tendency to follow and be influenced by the culture that we live in, <clears throat> a culture that is anti-supernatural, a culture that doesn't believe anything that they can't see, touch, measure, uh, apply science to. They don't believe in angels and demons. They don't believe in prayer. They don't believe in spirits. They don't believe in possession. And so for us as Christians being influenced and invaded by the culture around us, let's just stop for a moment and just wonder, are we, are we fallen in how we view the world and how we view our place in the spiritual battle that we're involved in? How is Satan at work in influencing us in these ways? So what does Satan do here in this passage? Let's look on a little bit. He interacts with Eve and he says this. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see what Satan does there? He, he takes away from God's word. He takes away that God actually said in chapter 2, verse 15. He said, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Do you see how God actually said, you shall eat of every tree, the easiest job description in the world. It's all yours, enjoy it all, be fruitful and multiply and, and just embrace all of my good creation, God said. Just don't eat from that one tree. And yet here Satan, Satan comes and he says this, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see how all of a sudden God seems like this stingy uh, holdout who's keeping good things back and Eve falls for it. I wonder how in your life do you fall for the same lie of Satan? How in your life do you perhaps have been in situations where you have embrace that lie that that God really is keeping back something good from you and that you need to take hold of something yourself in order to make your life better it could be in relationships where you feel like you're unhappy and uh, well if God really did love you and really did want what's best for you then he would make you happy and give you a good relationship but because you don't have you need to then take hold of something that you know to be wrong but with the belief that it's going to give you uh, all of the pleasure that you desire. You see, Satan, that's his lie. He tells you of all the pleasures, but he doesn't tell you of the pain that comes from it. What about with your job? Perhaps the desire to have more things and more money and less stress. And so you feel like, well, if God really wanted me to be settled and happy, then I would have this other job. And so you Apply for jobs that perhaps involve working on a Sunday that mean you never get to go to church. And so you believe the lie of Satan that, well, this is a good thing. This is a job. This is something that maybe God's given me an answer to my prayer. How is it that we've maybe fallen for these lies of Satan as he takes away from the goodness of God and speaks a subtle lie that actually God is withholding from us and we need to take matters into our own hand. Let's discuss that just for a few minutes. Eve obviously responds, doesn't she? Uh, and we see her response here in verse three. She says this, uh, the end of verse two, she says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden or even touch it lest you die. Do you see what Eve did was she added something to God's word. Do you see in uh, chapter 2 verse 16, what did God actually say? In verse 17 he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. He didn't say anything about not touching it. But Eve added that and it speaks to uh, something that gives birth in the heart of all of us. When we fear God and we desire to live right before him, a noble thing happens where we add extra barriers and extra restrictions and extra safeguards 
to stop us falling into sin. But that's called legalism. And what we find is that the church has added layers on layers, just like the Pharisees did of old, to prevent us ever crossing a line or getting near. Now, there's two things that I think go on in this culture around us. I think there is legalism that we need to be aware of in the church where we, we, we say things and do things and apply things that are not from the scriptures, noble as they may be. But equally, I think in this culture, we're probably more prone to dance around the fire a little too close, to dance to the edge a little bit too dangerously. I, um, I think in our culture as Christians, we live a little bit too like the world. We, we want to be just enough uh, like a Christian to be a Christian, but, but just enough like the world to fit in and not appear strange or weird. And so looking at legalism giving rise in the heart of Eve here, I wonder, what does that look like for us? What legalism do you see in the church? What legalism do you see or additions to God's word do you see in your own life and your own experience, your own um, learning and background that you've been brought up in? Or what do you see as areas where we dance just near enough to the edge to not fall off, um, but we're living dangerously? Um, in line with God's word. Why don't we discuss that for a little bit? Well, we've kind of looked at who Satan is. We've kind of looked at how he operates in terms of tempting and lying and subtly drawing us into the belief that maybe God doesn't want what's best for us and that we need to take hold of it ourselves. We then looked at how they themselves, just like us, we add to or take away from God's word in order to justify the way that we want to live. But look at the progression of sin as it takes hold in the heart of Adam and Eve here. Look in verse 6. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to be uh, able to make one wise. And so she took of the fruit and ate. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. You see that progression? She looked, Satan tempted and said, oh, you know, God doesn't want you to have that because it's, it's a good thing. Uh, he, he tempted her to, to desire to be like God. And she looked at it and she saw that it was good for food. Now, food is an essential, isn't it? We need it. We can easily justify the need for food. And then she saw that it was a delight to the eyes. It looked good. It was, a, it was attractive. It was pleasing. It promised much. And that it all, also was desired to make one wise. And she could be like God. That's what God said. He said in verse 17, he said, The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's knowledge that is the root of wisdom. Uh, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so Eve has this progression of seeing it. It's good. It's good for food. I need it. She looks at it. It's the delight to the eyes. It looks pleasing. This is going to be pleasurable for me. God surely wants me to enjoy things. And then she sees that it's good to make one wise. And she thinks, I can be like God. I can, I can work this out. And so as we bring our evening or afternoon to a close here, why don't we discuss that same progression as temptation takes hold in our life? Do you remember I was saying about Harry Newborough's um, example of the bird flying through? Uh, like temptation coming in and letting it go. Sin is not being tempted, but letting the bird make a nest in your mind, letting sin take hold and linger and then begin to take root and grow desire in you and that you might see it, that you might want it, that you might enjoy it. That's when you become uh, sinful in that temptation. So why don't we discuss here as we bring it to a close, what ways do you see that same progression work out in your own life? Maybe for me, it's uh, things like I was talking last, last night with some of the accountability guys that I'm doing with boot camp. And we were talking about overeating. We were talking about food. You know, it's something good that God's given us. Food is a good thing. But then we comfort eat. We overeat. We spend money we don't have to eat food we shouldn't take. It's good for us. We need to eat. It's a delight. 
it's going to taste good. And uh, I know better. It's, it's good to make one wise. I, I know better. I often think that in my own heart. I, I'm fine. I'll lose weight next month. What situation uh, do you see this pattern take hold in your own heart? Perhaps it's about money and spending. Perhaps it's about what you watch on TV. Perhaps it's about how much time you're spending on your phone. Perhaps it's about your relationship with your husband or wife. Perhaps it's about your career and your job. Perhaps it's about your spiritual disciplines. I don't know. But why don't we discuss this as we bring our time to a close?